Hello, my name is Nick Bowman. I'm an Associate Professor of Communication Studies at West Virginia University. And today I'm going to cover the final two chapters of our Introduction to CMC, a Functional Approach textbook. Uh, chapters 12 and 13 both deal generally with the idea of entertainment media. And for those of you who have been following along uh, for this semester or any other videos or ways you're accessing this content online, one of the things you've seen is that um, of the four ways we use entertainment media, or rather we use technology for information, and relationships, and persuasion. Uh, the fourth and final one that we talk about in our COM 105 class is the uh, role that communication technology plays in uh, seeking entertainment. So the next two uh, chapters will talk about that in this uh, one presentation. So you might think about it's Friday night and it's been a long week at school and you finally have a chance to relax and all you want to do is sit down on the couch and watch a movie. And if you grew up in the 90s, like, uh, like your uh, spokesman here and some of our co-authors, you probably spent hours in a video store. We get on our bikes and ride to the nearest blockbuster video or we go to the grocery store or the gas station and probably spend hours tearing through cassette tapes trying to find the one cassette tape that's going to make the night go a little easier. Um, you might talk to your parents and older brothers and sisters and, and see kind of what they went through. And, of course, I'd like you to tell me what you would do today. And my guess is you'd hop on Netflix, you'd hop on YouTube. You might open up your phone and just uh, fire through the videos there. And you might see a very different entertainment landscape, this uh, digital on-demand landscape to where we can very much, much access uh, entertainment. Uh, essentially at our fingertips, uh, so long as we have a decent connection. And uh, In fact, I'd invite you to go to our eCampus page and talk a bit about um, do, how you might encounter some of these um, you know, on-demand media products, and maybe tell us a bit of which ones you use and why. Now, when we talk about entertainment, uh, there are two distinctions I like to make, and it's really important for the rest of our chapter, and, and really for those of you who want to understand the media a little better is that entertainment is not simply a feature of enjoyment or hedonism and oftentimes when we talk about entertainment we tend to only talk about sort of laughing and pleasure and arousal and in fact a lot of the more recent research on the subject um, really breaks entertainment into two very different but kind of related parts of the uh, of the human experience and one of those would be the hedonic effects uh, these are going to be the immediate, positive, pleasurable, enjoyment, arousal, really fun time. You, you watch a cartoon and you laugh, you play a video game and you feel pumped up after playing it. And commonly when we say entertainment, we're usually talking about these hedonic effects. And I think in some ways, this is one of the reasons why people tend to sort of write off or dismiss enter entertainment media as being somehow um, maybe secondary or not as important. And well, first off, it is important that you enjoy yourself. It's important you take a break from your reality and, and perhaps step into the shoes of a character or watch a show or just uh, you know take a relaxing break here and there. But more importantly, there's a lot more to entertainment than just hedonism. And in fact, um, some scholars have argued for this idea of eudaimonia or eudaimonic effects. They're a bit longer lasting, they're more you know, contemplative and more meaningful. They tend to be associated with appreciation and insight and kind of reflecting on the human experience. And, you know, in many ways, we don't think about this, but a lot of the media that we consume leads to these appreciation effects. Um, I have fond memories of watching, um, you know, documentaries when I was a kid and, and um, you know, movies like Schindler's List or Hotel Rwanda, where these weren't films that were meant to entertain you. But of course, at the same time, they weren't educational lessons, but they were films that were meant to sort of make you think a little bit about the world around you and, and perhaps think about your role in preventing tragedies happening in the future. And if you were to interview somebody and ask them about Schindler's List, they might tell you that it was an entertaining product, but they probably wouldn't tell you that it was a very enjoyable one. Uh, in fact, one of the things I'd really like to hear from students is... Um, the kind of experiences you've had with uh, video games or film or television. Can, can you recall some particularly hedonic or particularly eudaimonic media? And if so, why don't we talk about those online? As I've said, enjoyment and appreciation are, are sort of uh, opposite sides of the same coin we might call entertainment. Um, and, uh, enjoyment being written in red there, it's the arousing, exciting, pleasurable, and diversionary information. And appreciation being the reflective, inspiring, expressive, and meaningful 
type of entertainment. And what's in front of you right now is actually a scale that's commonly used by researchers to try to explain whether or not people tend to prefer more eudaimonic or hedonic media products. And if you read really closely, I realize that the uh, quality of the images there isn't very great. This is a scale by Oliver and Rainey, um, and it's talked about in your book in much greater detail. And you can see some of the phrases like, I like movies that challenge my way of seeing the world which would be, as you see the bold numbers there, a quite eudaimonic effect. Whereas it's important to me that I have fun when watching a movie. It's a much more hedonic effect. And so what, what uh, Mary Beth Oliver and Art Rainey found in their research is that audiences tend to sort of group their entertainment experiences into these very different but sort of related reactions that we might call entertainment, meaning enjoyment and appreciation. And as you can imagine as a, as a budding media scholar that the way that the, the types of uh, feelings you might derive from your entertainment products may go a long way in explaining how they might affect you. Now, when we talk about entertainment, again, I want to remind us that it, it's not just distraction. And in fact, Aristotle famously said that the end of labor is to gain leisure. And, and what many people think he meant by this is that what was most important for us as humans is that we worked very hard to secure our place in life, to secure food, to secure shelter, um, to do all of these things so that we can have time to ourselves. And for some people like Aristotle, leisure time is sort of when human beings were able to be the most human and that perhaps it's not really all that human to work all day or sleep all night or eat food. But what makes humans remarkably interesting is that we have this leisure time that we choose to engage in both hedonic and eudaimonic type activities. And you might even say that the way someone spends their leisure time might say a whole lot about their version of what it is to be human. Entertainment has always been an integral part of human society. You know, we have ritual ceremonies developed around hunting cultures. Um, we saw early humans sort of uh, giving time to ponder life while struggling to survive, right? You've got the earliest humans who were hunters and gatherers, and they just simply survive from day to day. And yet very early on in their evolution, we see evidence of uh, cave paintings and other situations to where humans were taking time out of an incredibly busy um, day, busy life, to sort of ponder and reflect on their culture and their future. We see musical instruments and decorative skins that date back all the way back to 10,000 you know, BCE. And this might be important because it suggests again that humans are beginning to carve out time to engage in activities that really didn't help with their survival. Um, decorating animal skins and painting in caves doesn't put food on the table. At the same time, it engaged us in a very social, very meaningful way that perhaps got us to think more importantly and more critically about you know the future of our of our culture and if you go into the textbook it goes into much greater detail about the role of, that culture plays in the earliest development of uh, this thing we call leisure time when we find these tools for activities beyond survival people like aristotle argue that we evolved to essentially have the human spirit and as i've already said we directed these resources normally for survival towards ceremonial and spiritual pursuit, the earliest forms of art and culture we have in modern society. One of the greatest examples is the cave paintings that were found in Spain and France where you know, uh, early, early um, humans would use you know, berries and food products and hunting flints to, to carve into the walls of the cave while everybody else was out hunting. And what it sort of suggests is that there was a movement towards um, understanding not only how to live from day to day, but maybe why we live from day to day and perhaps how we can do it better. And for many people, they, they talk about how this evolution of, of leisure may have very well led to the types of cultures that we live in today. As we see here on the slides, um, we've got these the famous cave paintings uh, from Spain that were and, and also France that were found. And uh, this is one from Spain when they were exploring caves and one of the, some people argue it's one of the most important relics of ancient history. And if you download the slides, you can you can search for these images online and, and learn more information. But I'd actually like to hear from the students on a campus, and perhaps you can tell me, 
you know, why were these placed in caves? What were they meant to be? Think about the roles of uh, media, according to Laswell. That were these sources of information? Were they sources of persuasion? Were they sources of relationships? Or, or perhaps they were there to transmit some cultural heritage? And, and why? Why would it be so important to use this early form of mass media to transmit cultural heritage? And perhaps you can go on eCampus and explain your version of that. And maybe if you think if you had to draw a, a cave painting of your culture today, what would it be? And, and perhaps you can share it with us online. Now, if we fast forward very quickly to the, uh, the digital age, uh, one of the things we see is we still very much enjoy entertainment. We very much enjoy mass media as a form of mediated communication. And, um, you know, we, we see, you know, media products have gained and increasingly gained in popularity. And one of the things that we notice about today's digital media is this notion of interactivity. And in fact, some argue that interactivity is one of the main factors that might separate what we call hot and cool media. Hot being media products we have to sort of touch and lean in towards, and cool being media products we can kind of lay back and sort of passively consume. And we talked a bit about this when we discussed video games as learning tools in Chapter 6. And so I've shown on the screen here a series of different controllers of varying properties from different companies at different times in gaming history. And if I told you that task demand referred to a principle of, an, of a technology interface where we can kind of measure how much of its attentional resources it requires of the, the user, or in this place, the gamer, I might ask you if some of these controllers might actually have higher or lower task demand than other controllers. That is, are some of these controllers perhaps hotter than others. You have the Nintendo Wii, which you can pick it up and you don't really have to sort of learn the controller because it takes advantage of the, what's called natural mapping, the, the human perceptual system, where you just swing your arms and the controller swings around and the action on screen swings around. And so on one hand, you don't have to really learn very much to use a what we would call a naturally mapped controller. But on the other hand, um, the other controllers, the button controllers, the wired controllers, require you to learn a new mental network. And you got to push more buttons and activate more switches and kind of learn how certain buttons make certain things happen on screen. And so you could probably make an argument that these controllers might be higher in task demand because you got to learn more. So I'd like to hear what you guys think. And again, um, I invite everybody to hop on eCampus or our social media pages and perhaps uh, tell us what you think about these controllers. and. You know, which ones are hotter or cooler or which ones dipper in terms of task demand. And then, of course, why might that matter for, for media? Another sort of hot issue when we talk about entertainment in the digital age is how do we protect copyrights, right? Because we had sites like LimeWire and Napster, you know, particularly popular when I was in college, that have been accused of fostering digital piracy, where people are stealing information from other, you know, copyright holders online. Uh, downloading uh, songs and movies and TV shows and essentially not paying for them. And, you know, most computer users said, well, hey, I mean, I bought the album. I, I don't need to go to the store and pay 20 bucks for an album when I only want one song. And, you know, the, the media industry is so big and nameless anyways that it's not really fair to charge us all this money for products. And, you know, if you can't think of a better way to sell us music, then we're just going to steal it. And, of course, um. I mean, let's be honest, it was stealing. It is piracy. If you take something that's not yours and you don't pay for it, it's, it's breaking the rules. But at the same time, what you find is that these digital networks provided an enormous opportunity for the spread of media and culture and entertainment. And as we talked about way back in the early chapters, that digital information can be copied and replicated without really losing anything. It can be... Um, these are situations where we can actually go in and, you know, we can grab information, we can clone information, we can share it freely amongst the users. And if you're a media producer, that's great. Your message gets heard. But at the same time, you're not getting paid for it. And, you know, what good is a message if no one's going to pay you for that message? And today we, we've sort of come to a conclusion that we do embrace digital networks. We have companies like Apple and the iStore and, and iTunes where we've sort of come up with these ideas called digital rights management where we have found ways to encrypt files so that can't be uh, shared back and forth. But one of the pressing issues of the 21st century is um, how do we protect copyrights in, in an age of digital media? 
And do, do users even want to protect copyrights anymore? And so uh, once again, this, this might be a relatively interesting question to talk about online is, you know, when's the last time you went to the store and bought an album? And, and how does that compare to buying an album online? And, you know, do you think copyright should be protected today? Um, I'd like to hear more about it. Now, some of you may recognize the uh, slide on screen right now, and it was during this debate called the Stop Online Piracy Act, or SOPA. And of course, the textbook goes into much greater detail about SOPA, and there's also some links to the original proposal. But the idea here was that a lot of um, companies have been complaining, speaking of, of digital copyrights, that the websites that hold copyright infringing information should be kept liable for, for that activity. And here's an example. So I put together a, a Wikipedia page, and let's say that I, um, you know, as one of the Wikipedia editors, um, I steal information from the COM 105 textbook word for word, and I put it up in my own Wikipedia page and try to define, you know, entertainment in terms of hedonism and eudaimonia. So one of you guys takes that information, you steal it from the textbook, you put it on your own website, and then it's posted online. And the publisher of the textbook finds the information. And the argument is that it's really hard to find out kind of who put it there. And so many people wanted to hold the website accountable. So the example I'm giving right now is that Wikipedia would actually be accountable for making sure that one of the students in this class doesn't violate the textbook copyright. And if they did, they would shut Wikipedia down until the information was removed. Now, it sounds logical, right? I mean, um, you know, you can't track all the people. Many times online uh, posters are anonymous and we don't know who's posting information. And so perhaps if you hold the websites accountable, they'll be more um, likely to uh, track the information and, and keep their websites free of copyright infringement. But of course, there's a problem with this is that sites such as Wikipedia and uh, an infinite number of or near infinite number of websites um, they operate off of a principle of, of uh, free access, meaning that you go to Wikipedia and no one knows who writes the article. In fact, the reason that the articles are usually so so accurate, as we talked about in earlier chapters, is that they're crowdsourced for lots and lots of people build lots and lots of websites and they build them collaboratively. And in fact, one of the principles of Web 2.0, as we've discussed, is that it allows anybody anywhere to post information at any time. And when you're talking about that volume of engagement with content, many people thought that SOPA was a very dangerous law because what it would do is it would take it would only take one copyright infringement to shut down an entire website. In fact, if somebody wanted Wikipedia shut down, they could go in, intentionally post copywritten information, and then alert the authorities to it. And so what Wikipedia did is they had a protest. And on the day, one of the, you know, the days leading up to the SOPA vote, which by the way, it wasn't, it, it did not pass through the uh, US Congress, um, they blacked their page out. They, they, they put up this warning sign. So whenever you went to Wikipedia, this is the page you got. And the idea they were trying to show is, you know, if SOPA passes, Wikipedia is going to be dead. Now, again, at the same time, that doesn't really fix the issue of taking people's information without their permission and sharing it. Um, and this is one of the curious problems of the Web 2.0 driven 21st century is that we do sort of have a situation to where many copyright holders claim that because of technology, their copyrights aren't worth as much money anymore. At the same time, the open nature of the internet is what makes the internet useful, is that anybody can go on and read anything at any time with, with relatively little consequence and censorship. It's a debate that's not going to be solved anytime soon. In fact, I, if one of the students in this course were particularly curious about media law, it's going to be a hot career in the future as we try to unlock some of these situations. But I might ask you, is it fair for Wikipedia to be held accountable for its users' activities? Um, and if you want a good analogy, is it fair to hold a, a bar or a restaurant accountable for the activities of, let's say, a, a drunken patron? So let's think about that one and perhaps talk about it online as well. Another part of entertainment in the digital age is this uh, portable entertainment. So going back to 1979, we had the Sony Walkman where you could put a cassette tape and a little device and you could carry music around with you which was just considered an incredible thing. It was something that we've just not seen before. 
um, portable technology allowed people to take their leisure with them. And anybody who, who were exercises or walks or has an iPod understands the value of having that entertainment content. You know, in 1989, when I was in elementary school, it was the Nintendo Game Boy. It was that little gray brick with that black and white screen that allowed you to play Mario during recess or during the lunchroom or hide it from the teacher and, or play on the bus on the way home. And boy, that was a big deal to play video games on the road. In 2011, we had the Sony PlayStation Vita, which I, I actually have one myself. In fact, right now, I'm, I'm recording this, this audio lecture from Germany. I can fire up my PS Vita, I can access my PlayStation 4 from my home in Morgantown and play it live whenever I want to on demand. It's a pretty remarkable thing. From battery operated portable sound to a rechargeable personal entertainment device in 30 years. This Vita can get me online, I can watch videos, I can watch any number of um, different products literally on demand as they come and, and experience both those enjoyment and appreciation effects. Again, uh, I offer a very quick summary of chapter uh, 12 because this, this uh, video lecture combines both chapters. But enter entertainment is an enduring human pursuit. It's essential to the human spirit. Entertainment can be both enjoyable and meaningful, and the digital age has ushered in a broader array of entertainment messages, perhaps more involving than ever before, but with new legal challenge as the distinction between media user and producers becomes blurred. As we've asked you for all of our chapters so far, we want you to consider going online, maybe using the media's tools hashtag on Twitter or checking out our Facebook group for the textbook. Can you recall a meaningful experience in watching TV shows or a movie or a video game perhaps? Do you still use any analog media, that is physical media, cassette tape, for example? What about physical formats of digital media? Provide some examples. Have you ever played a sandbox video game? This is a video game that doesn't have a particular path, but it's a very open world. And how is that experience different from other games you may have played? Think about hot and cool media. And I wonder, have you personally ever gotten in trouble, legal or otherwise, for posting a YouTube video with trademarked or copyrighted content? Uh, don't be shy, we won't tell on you, but I want to talk about these experiences and see if we can understand uh, how to understand uh, today's new digital entertainment. Now, as I said, this uh, lecture actually combines chapters 12 and 13, and so I'm going to spend the final couple minutes here talking about an overview of the uses and effects of digital media entertainment. So we know from anecdotal evidence that there is a tragic history of media effects reported. The, the Sandy Hooks Elementary shooting, the Virginia Tech shootings, and the uh, Aurora, Colorado theater shooting during a screening of a Batman film. And in most of these situations, oftentimes um, violent media has been to blame, where folks have said that one of the common threads with these shooters is that they play games like Call of Duty and they play violent shooting games. And, and there's a general fear that these types of games might actually make people more aggressive. And there is a a very lively debate within psychology and communication studies as to whether or not these effects are there. But it's important we discuss them because the possibilities terrify us. Indeed, we've researched moral panic in the media for a very long time. As early as 300 AD, we've burned books that we didn't think would support society, right? Um, the Catholic Church, and this isn't a knock on Catholics, but it's an example, um, banned the writings of Victor Hugo and Galileo and, and um, Alexander Dumas because they were considered sort of anti-social, anti-society. They promoted views that didn't fit in with the common man. They were thought to be morally perverse. And, and in fact, this uh, banned book list, the Laborum Prohibitorum, it's like, I apologize, I'm not pronouncing that very well, it's in your textbook. The list of banned books um, basically was around until the 1960s. We had the Comstock Act of 1873, which was the U.S. Mail Service and a man named Comstock who actually pushed for um, postal employees to be able to search the mail and they banned the um, mailing of pornography or obscene content and in fact postal workers were allowed to carry firearms and, and arrest people who were sending vice through the mail and you know his argument was that you're, you're, you're corrupting society by, by mailing things to people and mailing people obscenity and pornography and 
you know, we've often been concerned about the extent to which these media products that are so incredibly popular and contain such incredible acts of antisocial behavior, you know, surely they must be affecting us in some way, or at least that's always been the question. When we talk about things such as um, uh, obscenity, we might understand the notion of, um, of you know, the three-pronged test. This is called the Miller test, and it's how, at least in the United States, we tend to determine whether or not something is obscene or not. And it's whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find something appealing to a prurient interest, whether the work depicts or describes a, in a patently offensive way sexual conduct, and whether the work might lack serious scientific value. Well, what I might ask you guys to do is I've put a picture on here. It's a flyer from the World Erotic Art Museum, which is stationed in Miami Beach, Florida. Well, this flyer is questionable, right? It um, suggests certain things. It shows certain body parts in a certain way. And, and I wonder if you think it would be okay to hand this flyer out in your hometown. That is, do you think this flyer would pass or fail the three-prong test. And so I invite you to hop on any campus and argue your case uh, like a Supreme Court justice. There's different approaches to the study of media effects. And I think the earliest approach was called the magic bullet theory. And it was essentially argued that media messages act like magic bullets. And, and they hit people um, directly, they hit them powerfully, and they have universal effects. And, and this, the idea here is that you know, just like a bullet, if, if you were to shoot a number of people, and, a, and I apologize for kind of the graphic metaphor, the idea is that that bullet would affect the same person, everybody the same way. Similar to a hypodermic needle. If I were to inject 20 people listening to this lecture with something, they would all essentially get the same, the same injection, the same dosage at the same time. And this was often thought to be how media works. People see a media message and they respond to it. People are thought to have kind of universal instincts and universal processing and reactions to media. And now, there are many scholars that argue that there never really was such thing as a magic bullet approach, but rather what might have been happening is that the earliest research on media effects just kind of assumed media had an effect. Because one of the things we found in the 20s and 30s and 40s in some of the early mass media research is we did indeed find strong effects but they weren't universal. A common example talked about in your book is the War of the Worlds broadcast by, by Orson Welles in, in the 1930s, where he wrote a radio broadcast based on H.G. Wells' book, The War of the Worlds, and essentially convinced people that aliens were invading the United States. And there was a mass panic. As, you know, there were estimates that maybe one-sixth of the audience, or between one and two million Americans, actually thought aliens were invading us. But at the same time, in that research, it was found that there were lots of folks who didn't think aliens were invading. And in fact, the scholars went into much greater detail and found that whether or not you believe the broadcast was very dependent on, you know, sort of your educational background, your critical background, where you lived, your religious background and orientation. And the textbook sort of goes over some other more details of this. But the point we're making is that the magic bullet really didn't hold up empirically. And in fact, in most media research, we rarely, if ever, find direct and powerful and universal media effects. And we don't often follow a magic bullet approach. Now, in response to sort of these lack of magic bullet effects, a lot of folks started studying indirect media effects. And they basically argued that the media is like a paper tiger, where it looks really ferocious, but in fact, there are no media effects, and all of the effects of media on people have to do with people. So they might say, you know, you watch a violent program, and the only way you're ever going to be violent is if you're a violent person, or if you live in a violent environment, or if you have access to weapons. And it essentially argued that media effects only exist when something else exists. And in fact, some people argued from this approach that people have more influence over the media than the media has over people. You know, audiences selectively expose content. Um, if audiences don't like violence, and violence wouldn't be on TV, and, and just some similar examples. And the point that I want to make here is it was a bit of an overcorrection, right? Um, you know, to go from a magic bullet effect where media had direct and powerful and universal, and then when that wasn't supported, to go to an indirect effect model where media has no impact on people, 
That's a bit inaccurate too, because we do know that media campaigns work, advertising works, marketing works. There is research showing some, you know, relatively small but still important violence effects. And that kind of takes us to the current approach today. And it's an approach that is as a media psychologist and communication scholar that I tend to follow. And it's basically the idea of select, selective effects based on individual differences, or we might call it the limited comma powerful effects model. And the idea here is that media, do, media messages can have an impact, and they can even have a direct impact. But the direct impacts are usually very small until they fall under certain, certain circumstances. And so, you know, there probably is a correlation between playing video games and having aggressive thoughts. And in normal, everyday life, that correlation is small enough to where it's not very concerning. But you get somebody who's kind of aggressive or has had a bad day or has access to firearms or weapons of some kind or is playing with others in a very aggressive way, then perhaps you might find an effect. Whereas if you play a violent video game, but then the video game sort of contextualizes the violence and teaches you that it's wrong and you don't have access to things and you're not an aggressive person, then you actually probably don't react very violently at all. And we often call this the limited powerful effects model. And we'll talk about a lot of these both in the textbook and online this week as we go through eCampus. One of the models that I tend to use in a lot of my research, I sort of jokingly call the baby cowboy model. Whereas if you were to say the magic bullet effect would say stimulus response every time, right? If there's a stimulus, it's automatically a response. The uh, limited but powerful effects paradigm would say the stimulus of response mechanism really goes through the organism. And that while there can still be a gray line there, a, a small effect of stimulus on response, you have to also understand how the stimulus affects the person and then how the person eventually responds to the message. And another way of thinking about this is we call in the very beginning of class that we defined communication as the stimulating of meaning in the mind of another. And if that's how we define communication, then we have to study the organism, the human, and how they sort of process the message before we can understand the responses. In other words, people don't always process the same message the same way. And understanding media effects means we have to understand the intersection of the content and the person receiving that content. And it's something we'll talk more about throughout this class and beyond. In fact, some people say that we don't even know if making media interactive might make, for example, violence effects stronger, right? Because one camp would say that video games require us to learn and rehearse the violence, right? In a video game, if someone's being violent, it's because it's you doing it, right? You're the perpetrator. You're, you're the aggressor. You're the violent agent. You're the weapon of death. Whereas in a movie, you don't really have control over what happens on screen. But some other folks think that video games, because they require us to actually do the violence we see on screen, that we might actually think about it more and even learn from it. Perhaps there could be sort of a meaningfulness reaction. And one of the common examples here is the game in the corner that some of you might recognize is called Spec Ops The Line. If you click on this message or, or, or download the video and watch it yourself, it's a very famous scene called the white phosphorus scene where the player has to actually drop a bomb on a village of people only to find out that it's a chemical weapon and the people he's dropped it on are innocent. And the, the, the creator of the game, Walt Williams, um, he says that his goal wasn't to be gory necessarily, but he was trying to show people and to get them to think about what he might consider real violence. Like it's easy to say that violence is going to affect people, sort of a monkey see, monkey do approach. But what about when that violence is presented with, with results and with consequences that aren't necessarily hedonic and enjoyable? Other prominent media effects we common study is the role of sexual content in rape myths. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the, the rape myth research is a general suggestion that people who believe in rape myths believe that when a woman in particular is raped, that oftentimes it's her fault. You know, she may have wore promiscuous clothing or, you know, she didn't say no or she may have led her rapist on. And if you read the research, it's pretty saddening to think that oftentimes we blame the victim for being raped. And 
Unfortunately, we do see research that shows that sexual content, like por pornographic content in particular, can often result in people believing in the rape myth more. And one of the arguments is that sexual content often shows women in very sort of uh, victimized, compromising positions. And as you begin to enjoy or become aroused from that content, you start to kind of think that uh, sex is a bit more trivial and a bit more sort of male-oriented or male-dominated. And again, the, the textbook goes into greater detail, but it's an effect we're actively studying today. There's research on cultivation theory and the mean world effect, and this is a, an argument that uh, when we watch particularly television, but really any type of media, that oftentimes our media products tell a very similar story. So if you were to read the newspaper on a daily basis, it's a lot of bad news, a lot of crime and punishment news in today's world, a lot of terrorism and war news. And what we see, this man named jo uh, um, George Gerbner studied this, he found that people who watch a lot of entertainment television, or really for that matter, even news television, tended to overestimate how dangerous the world really was. Because the notion is that the more you watch TV, the more likely your, your view and vision of the world would kind of align with the world on TV, and he called it the mean world effect. We see notions of racism and parasocial contact, which is kind of interesting that uh, many people argue that the audiences we see on television, the people we see on TV, are oftentimes far more diverse than the people that we surround ourselves with every day. And this could be a good thing or bad thing, because on the one hand, being exposed to people of a different race and ethnicity often makes us more accepting of that race and, and ethnicity. At the same time, many entertainment programs tend to showcase minorities in very negative ways. Um, they're often the butt of the jokes, or they're the criminals, or they're not the main characters. And of course, if you show somebody a, a race and their ethnicity, and you consistently portray that race or ethnicity in a very negative way, what might end up happening is that we think those people aren't, aren't so great after all. And it's also an area of continued research, especially in the United States, where the um, sort of the um, demographics of the U.S. are, are, are in a very um, rapid change of flux um, as we go into the 21st century. We also see concerns about anti-socialization and displacement. And the idea behind the displacement hypothesis is that, quite simply, you can't do two things at once. Uh, time spent playing video games is time not spent playing outside. And so it's commonly referred to as a displacer. And so if you're, if you're consuming entertainment media, and Robert Putnam had a book called uh, Bowling Alone, where he said that people today don't talk to each other. They stay in their house, they watch TV, they watch movies, and they engage in very solo and isolation type entertainment media, which was resulting in them being more antisocial. Now, there's been a lot of challenges to this, and for many reasons, uh, a colleague of mine, Rachel Cowart, researches this, for example, is that a lot of entertainment, and as Elizabeth Cohen, who's a, a, a fellow professor here at West Virginia University, uh, they argue that media consumption is very social. And even if you're not consuming it with people in the room, called co-location or co-consumption, oftentimes you consume media to talk to folks the next day about it. So these are all areas that, on the one hand, there are a lot of effects from this sort of uh, stimulus response approach. But as we study more the organism variables, more the limited and powerful effects, we're starting to find that the effects aren't as strong as we originally thought they were. It's an area of, um, of, ex of uh, interest. And for those of you who are interested in studying these things, we should continue to stay in touch because um, uh, West Virginia University is one of the colleges and universities that studies uh, mass media effects, especially with communication technology. So again, I offer a very quick summary of this chapter, and I want to suggest that the study of media effects has been a prominent area of communication technology for the past hundred years. And our views on the topic have evolved quite a bit to consider the interaction of individual and media characteristics. It's equally important in understanding the powerful and limited conditions by which media can impact us deeply. Media effects can be positive or negative, and it's very important that we study both sides of that coin. And finally, for our, our 13th chapter, I want you to go online to the Media's Tools hashtag or to the uh, course, uh, the textbook Facebook page. And do you believe violent video games cause aggression? Why or why not? And what sorts of studies would you design to test your beliefs? Tell me in the last 24 hours on your own Facebook wall, how many have seen posts have you viewed, either intentionally or not? And what criteria are you using to evaluate these? And does your technology usage make you feel more or less connected to your friends? 
So on behalf of the uh, introduction to CMC, a functional approach team, and, and your professors here at, at West Virginia University, I want to thank you for listening to our 13 chapters, and hopefully you enjoyed yourselves um, recognizing that these videos are meant to be relatively short overviews of your chapters. Um, make sure you're reading those chapters, and make sure you're asking us questions, because we're here to help. Thank you, and have a good day. Go Ears!